الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما We praise God Almighty We praise Him and we thank Him For He is the Lord of the heavens and the earth and the creator of all therein, and he is our Lord and our creator. We thank him for having given us life, for having created us with the intellect to be able to understand the beauty of the creator through the beauty of his creation. We declare our belief that there is no deity worthy of worship except for God Almighty. And we declare our belief in all of the prophets and messengers that he has sent through time and in the seal of them all, the Prophet Muhammad My dear brothers and sisters, why are you here? Not why are you here at Jama'ah, but why are you here? Why did God create you? Why did He create us? He is not in need of us. Of course we know the tradition in the Qur'an that He has not created human beings and jinn for any other purpose but to worship them. But there's more to the story. For God recounts in the Quran the story of the creation of the first human being. And in this story is insight and nuance to our purpose of existence, to our goal as individuals. What is it that we're striving for? Why are we here? So let us, in this first part of the khutbah, Reflect upon the story of the creation of the first human being, Adam alayhi salam. And reflect on the wisdom imparted by God Almighty in this story so that we may grasp it in a way that's relevant for our individual lives in this day and age. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins back in Surah Al-Baqarah verses 30 through 39 in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and remember when your Lord said to the angels I am about to establish upon earth a khalifa a caliph a vicegerent a viceroy a caretaker one who shall inherit it let's just pause there for one second when God told the angels he's going to create human beings, he didn't say I'm going to create human beings. He didn't say men and women. He said I'm going to create a species that will be responsible for taking care of the earth and those that live on it. This is how he described us to the angels. Now the angels, as we all know, have no free will. They're all good. They're obedient. They didn't get it. They didn't see the wisdom of the creation of human beings. And not in a rebellious way, because like all angels are good, we all know that. But they didn't perceive it, so they asked a question. They said, They said, will you place therein on this earth one who shall spread corruption and shed blood Whereas it is we who extol your glory and hallow your name. They didn't get it. They said, why create human beings? They're just going to do all kinds of bad. We're here and we're praising you and we're obedient. Why would you go and do that? So God responds at first in a way that's a little bit unsatisfying. But the story that follows it fills in the blank. He says, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know something that you do not know. God has omnipotence or omniscience he's all aware of knowing all things so he says I see something I know something that you do not see there's a wisdom that they didn't get the story continues and as it unfolds we see what that is and right away Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says describing Adam and something very unique about human beings Adam being the archetypal human being 
He says, وَعَلَّمَ آدَمَ الْأَسْمَاءَ كُلَّهَا And he taught Adam the names of all things. Now this little phrase is enigmatic. What does it mean? It's mysterious on a, on a, at first glance. But when you take it in context and you reflect upon the significance of this little phrase, he taught Adam the names of all things, what could he be referring to? Let's unpack it a little bit. To teach Adam the names of all things, you could say, is that he taught human beings language. To name something, to know the names of things, is to be able to articulate what that thing is in words. Language. Human language is on a different order than any other earthly creation that we're aware of. Human beings, because of language, and if there's any neuroscientists in here, you can confirm, confirm that it's because of language that we are able to think in very complicated, abstract terms. It gives us a cognitive ability, our language does, that we would not otherwise have. And it sets us on a different plane than other kinds of creatures. But this is not the end of the, of the characteristic that God endowed us with as human beings. Because all of that is simply a precursor or a necessary <coughs> faculty for us to possess in order for us to really possess what makes us unique in this context and in this story, which is free will. It's free will, because if you, as an individual, cannot understand the consequences of choices that you make, then how can you be held accountable for them? So having intelligence is a prerequisite for free will. And this story, as we know, and we're going to get into it, is about choices that are being made. When they're placed in the garden and we're going to get there, they, they make a, cho a choice. But they make other choices afterwards and we're going to get to that. They're not the only ones with choice though. You can say, well, what about Iblis? What about Shaitan? What about the Jinn? They also have free will. True. True. But the Jinn didn't have the responsibility of inheriting the earth. So human beings, we have both free will and the responsibility for taking care of the earth, for being accountable for how we t treat this, this planet and those who live on it, one another, and the animals and the plants. So the story continues. He taught Adam the names of all things. <laughs> then he displayed those things to the angels and said to the angels, in, in what seems like a very, really harsh expression, you name these things, if what you say is true. Now they didn't really make a statement. They just asked the question, why would you go and create human beings? So God says in response, if what you say is true, really what they imply, that there's no wisdom in creation of human beings, if what you say is true, you demonstrate this skill. And of course the angels are good and obedient and they acquiesced immediately. They said, Subhanaka, glory be to you. La ilma lana illa ma allamtana. We have no knowledge, no skill set, no ability, except that which you have imparted to us, that which you taught us, that you, which you have bestowed upon us. <laughs> you are all-knowing and truly wise. Then, showing off Adam, he says, <laughs> Adam, tell them their names. And as soon as Adam told them their names, <laughs> And as soon as Adam told them their names, he said, Did I not tell you that I alone know the hidden realities of the heavens and the earth and all that you would reveal and conceal therein? Now, here comes, here comes uh, another commandment and the introduction of Shaytan. And we said to the angels, prostrate yourselves before Adam. Not in worship of Adam, but in acknowledgement that there's some potentiality in human beings to be higher in rank than even the angels. One, one Bosnian Mufti put it this way, he said, angels are intellect without whim. Animals are whim with, without intellect or little intellect. Human beings, we have the balance of both. 
And if we allow our whim, our emotion to overcome and dominate our intellect, then we are lower in rank than the animals. However, if we allow our intellect not to turn off or to shut down our emotion, but to guide our emotion, to direct it, to steer it, to control it and push it in the right direction, then we can be higher in rank even than the angels. <coughs> Subhanakah, subhanAllah. He says, prostrate yourselves before Adam. They all did except for Iblis. Now Iblis wasn't an angel, he was a jinn. Or kind of in a jinn as it says in the Quran. Which means he had free will. And he was jealous for many reasons, but he said he was better, he was made of fire, human beings were made from earth. <coughs> You can consider it the first kind of racism, arrogance, bigotry. But for whatever reason, maybe he was jealous because human beings had responsibility to earth. God is honoring Adam by having the angels prostrate. Whatever the reason, he was consumed by that animosity, that hatred, that, that jealousy. And it blurred his vision. It distorted his perception of the true nature of his relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it says, Abba, he rejected God's command, was takbara, and he perceived himself bigger than he really was. He gloried in his arrogance, as Muhammad Asad translates it. Wakanamin al kafirin, and he was thereby a kafir. Now, kafir sometimes we mistranslate it as unbeliever, but he wasn't an unbeliever in the sense that he disbelieved in God. He was communicating with God, and God was, God was instructing him, and he was rejecting God's command. Kafir means to cover up. It means kafara is to cover up. And when you do kafara, that's a good thing. Kafara means to expiate your sins, to cover up your bad deeds with good deeds. So it means simply to cover up. But kafir is not good. It means to cover up the truth, to deny the truth, as Muhammad Asad translates it as well. So he distorted the truth by having this inflated ego, distorted his perception of reality and the true nature of his relationship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he rejected God's command. So he made a choice. He had free will, he made a choice. وَقُلْنَا يَا آدَمُ اسْكُلْ أَنْتَ وَزَوْجُكَ الْجَنَّةِ And we said, O Adam, dwell you and your wife in the garden. وَقُلْ أَمِنْهَا رَغَدًا حَيْثُ شِئْتُمَا And eat freely therein wherever you may wish. وَلَا تَقْرَبَ هَذِهِ الشَّجَرَةَ فَلَكُونَ مِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ And do not approach this one tree, lest you become transgressors. We all know what happens. فَأَزَلَّهُمَ الشَّيْطَانُ عَنْهَا فَأَخْرَجَهُمَ مِمَّا كَانَ فِيهِ Shaytan tempted both of them. Now, on a, on a side note here, Hawa isn't mentioned by name in the Qur'an. She's not given a, 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 a name. We know her as Hawa from the other literature, from the Hadith literature, etc. But she's not given a name proper in the Qur'an. She doesn't have a big introduction. However, it's important to note that the Quranic narrative doesn't blame Eve for what happens. Women are not the root of all evil. This is not part of an Islamic discourse. This is in other traditions. In our tradition, shaitan tempted both of them. They both partook from the tree and they, they were all kicked out of the garden. So my dear brothers and sisters, and those who, who are coming later, my question that I'm asking myself and all of us here is, why are we here? What is our purpose? And we learn from the story of Adam some insight into the answer to that question. And when he is given intelligence and free will and given the opportunity to obey or disobey, Adam and Eve on this instant disobeyed God. So did Shaitan. So did Shaitan when he was instructed to bow. So my dear brothers and sisters, what makes Adam and Eve so human? And shaitan, so shaitanic, when they all disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The difference, my friend, my brothers and sisters, is what they did next. Shaitan asked for something, but it wasn't for forgiveness. He asked for more time so he could do more bad. Adam and Eve both repented. فَتَلَقَّ Adamu, And in the other narrative, they both repented. فَتَابَ عَلَيْهِ إِنَّهُ هُوَ التَّوَّابُ الرَّحِيمُ And God turned back upon him and upon both of them with mercy, with mercy and forgiveness and compassion and grace. So we can say as Muslims, yes, we believe in original sin, but we also believe in original repentance and original grace and salvation. So our story arc is different than you find in some other traditions. In the Christian tradition, it's a different story arc. 
In the, in the Islamic tradition, God is loving and merciful and compassionate and forgiving by his very nature. And so when we are given free will, we try to do our best to make good choices. But when we fall short, and we will, to not despair, to not give up and not, not entrench ourselves in doing wrong like shaitan did, but to follow the example of Adam salam, and his wife, Hawa salam, in doing the hard work of turning back towards God. The word in Arabic is toba. Toba means to turn. And when we're committing a an offense, an aggression, a transgression <laughs> against God or our own selves, we're turning a blind eye to God. We're turning away from God, metaphorically. And repentance means you have to go back and face God. You have to face what you did. You have to, you have to acknowledge. And if it involves transgression against another person, you have to make up for that as well. But if it's just against God or your own self, you have to acknowledge that and do the hard work of facing up to that transgression, that misdeed, misstep, bad decision, and turn back to God without despair. That's why God reminds us in the Qur'an, throughout the Qur'an, that He is Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most compassionate, the most merciful. So on this day of Jum'ah, my dear brothers and sisters, when I ask the question, why are we here? And we reflect upon the story of creation that God endowed Adam as the first human being, and therefore, thereby all of us, with free will, that we may make choices in life. And what is our character other than the accumulation of our choices? That we may make choices in our life that help us become better human beings. And when we fall short, we do the hard work of learning from our mistakes, turning back to God and trying to grow, trying to grow from that, th those missteps. Not that we may earn paradise, but that we might be more worthy of God's mercy and compassion by having given it our best. Let us on this day of Jum'ah ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness for what He knows and you know that you did in transgression and in negligence. And you will find God most compassionate, most merciful. <laughs> My dear brothers and sisters, we have purpose as believers. Our purpose is to try and become good people, to have good character, to try and use the free will and the intellect that we are given to try and grow closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, more aware, more, be more in tune and more sensitive and to fulfill our purpose of taking care of the earth and each other, all those that live on it. This is, the, this is the story of, of our beloved Prophet Adam, as told by Allah Taala in the Qur'an. And so in this last few minutes, I want to share three practical things that we might be able to do to help us prepare ourselves for that standing before God, which we will do individually on the Day of Judgment. And the first one is simply to have the right state of mind. The right state of mind, what is it as a believer? The right state of mind is articulated in the Qur'an through the word sub, patience. Now, patience is oftentimes misunderstood because we hear in the context of telling our children or being told by others to sit quietly, to not move, not make a fuss. That's not patience, my dear brothers and sisters. Sub, patience is to recognize that whatever you face, whether it's goodness, whether it's good fortune or misfortune, that God who is in charge of all things is the source of that. And the only question we ask as believers, and we, have, we are very fortunate to have clarity in our faith, to know what questions to ask, and it's not why. It's not why, why did I, what did I do to deserve, it's not, not the question of a believer. The question of the believer is, how? How do I respond in a way that's most beautiful and pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's the question. We're not confused. We trust in God's goodness. We trust that whatever we face, if we respond to it in the right way, that it will be pleasing to God. As the Prophet Muhammad said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, kullahu khayr. Amazing is the state of the true believer, the mu'min. For everything that befalls him or her is good. Then أَصَابَتُهُ سَرَّا شَكَرَ فَكَانَ خَيْرًا لَهُ 
وإن أصابته ضراء صبرا صبر patient فكان خيرا له no matter what befalls a believer, it's all good. If something felicitous, something, some good fortune befalls a, a true believer, then he or she is grateful. And that gratitude is good for his or her soul. And if some difficulty, some misfortune, some calamity were to befall a believer, a true believer, then that person demonstrates sabr, patience. But patience meaning a recognition that it comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the question is not why, but how. One of my mentors, the late Dr. Hassan Hatut, Allah Yarhamu. When he was a young man, newly married, his wife and him and his wife, they had a, a baby girl. And he was off working. His wife and the baby were in the car. They were got, got in a car accident. And he received word. He wasn't with them. He received word that his, that his daughter died. It was shocking. His little baby girl died. And when he received word at that first instance, he turned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said, Ya Allah, you have given me my girl. And you have taken from me my girl. You have taken her from me. How do I respond to this in a way that's most beautiful and pleasing to you? What could be more difficult than losing a child? But if in that moment, as emotionally wrenching as it is, and heart-rending as it is, to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that moment, and recognize that He is the source, even of that grief and that pain, and to ask, how is it that I can respond? You're putting me through this. Tell me how to respond. Show me how to respond. Help me to respond in the right way. And if we can do that for something as difficult as losing a child or a loved one, then we can face anything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to put in our pathway towards Him. The second thing, my dear brothers and sisters, to prepare us for that day of standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to have the right state of heart. I teach at Bayan Claremont, it's an Islamic graduate school. And, and we educate imams and uh, Islamic school teachers and principals, chaplains for hospitals and universities military and the prison system. And we have Muslims and even some non-Muslims take our courses and some years ago I was teaching an Arabic class, Quranic Arabic class, and one of the students was a Caucasian, middle-aged white guy who converted to Islam. He was a Sufi. He, he fell in love with God Almighty. He heard about Islam through his, his, his search, his spiritual journey. He ended up embracing Islam and he wanted to learn the Qur'an so he could have direct access to the revelation. And he was an artistic person, he was a musician, and he, and he worked in that industry full time, but he was taking this course because he was really driven to be able to, to, read, to read and understand the Qur'an firsthand. And he was diligent, he was a great student. And when he would go to work, everyone else, he was a, repairing musical instruments at the local high school school district, you, uh, I live, I come from Los Angeles, the Los Angeles Unified School District, everyone would be listening to music and repairing the instruments, he would be listening to the Qur'an, he would be listening to Arabic and he would be repeating, so, repeating softly to himself. And in the era in which we live, some people feel emboldened to express some kind of bigotry, animosity towards individuals who are apparently Muslim, who look Muslimy, who act Muslimy, and so one of his colleagues spoke to the supervisor and they said, this person is reciting Arabic, I don't feel comfortable. So the supervisor called in this young man, Paul, to his, to his office and he said, Paul, you may not utter any words in Arabic in this workspace. So Paul shared that story with the class. Everyone was, was outraged. This is, this, you got to sue, First Amendment violation. This is outrageous. What are you going to do? He just kind of smiled. He was a gentle soul. And he continued on his way. The same person demonstrated some other kinds of hostility towards him. He figured out who it was. So he went and he confronted the brother. He went and he confronted him. But not with hatred. He had a gentleness about it. And he said, you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't mean to make you feel uncomfortable here at work. 
the person who had been plotting and scheming and trying to get him in trouble and get him fired, when Paul approached him in that way, something moved him and he broke down in tears. He started crying. He said, you know what? It's not, it's not really you. I'm just, I'm having some family issues. I'm having some financial issues. And, he, and his heart was transformed. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us in the Quran, لَا تَسْتَوِي الْحَسَنَةُ وَلَا سَيِّئَةُ إِدْفَعْ بِالَّتِي هِيَ أَحْسَنُ فَإِذَا الَّذِي بَيْنَكَ وَبَيْنَهُ عَدَاوَةٌ كَأَنَّهُ وَلِيُّ الْحَمِينَ Evil and good are not the same. Repel evil with what is better until the one who is like your worst enemy becomes like your best friend. SubhanAllah. My, my brother is a firefighter. And if you were to ask him, what's the best way to put out a fire? Is it with fire? Because you hear people say all the time, you got to fight fire with fire. you got to fight fire with fire. You, 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 if you ask him, you got to fight fire with fire? And he say, well, you crazy? You fight fire with water. So what is this fighting fire with fire? Is it, well, if you're desperate and there's a raging wildfire and you have not enough, of, uh, not enough water to put it out, you try and maybe light a backfire to burn the fuel so that when the fire gets there, it won't have anything to burn and it'll stop there. But it's dangerous. You start a backfire, sometimes that makes the fire even worse and it happens all the time. So, this verse in the Quran and the example of our Prophet Muhammad وسلم, teaches us as believers, we don't fight fire with fire. We don't fight hatred with hatred. We, we respond to hatred and evil with what is better, with goodness, with love, because we're not desperate. We have a deep well that's filled with the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And it's not going to be depleted no matter what we face. So my dear brothers and sisters, having the right state of mind to recognize that everything comes from God, to have the right state of heart, which is to respond to whatever we face and whomever we face with love and goodness. Taking the higher road, because this is our, the example of our prophet and the wisdom of the Quran. And lastly, my dear brothers and sisters, to prepare ourselves for the day of judgment, to stand before Allah SWT. Not that we can earn paradise, but that we might be more, more, de more deserving of it if we give it our best effort. It's to pursue excellence in our action, to have the right state of action, which is excellence in everything that we do. If you pursue excellence in your profession, in your relationships, as a father, as a mother, as a neighbor, as an employee, as an employer, then you will command the respect of those around you. And in putting in that effort, and if you do it for the sake of God Almighty, then you, it, will be, it will be transformed. Whatever action that you do will be transformed and elevated as an act of worship. And it will transform the perception. One of the things we always complain about as a community is how people misunderstand our faith. Well, each one of us is an ambassador to the faith. And if we pursue excellence, we will be known by our actions. We have a pope these days named Pope Francis. He's named after St. Francis of Assisi, who was not a pope. And it's reported that he said, in essence, it's been not 100% been verified that he said these exact words, but in essence what he taught his followers was to go out and preach the gospel. And if you have to, but only if you have to, use words. In other words, you should be Manifesting your faith through your deeds, through your character, through the way you carry yourself through this world. If we pursue excellence, people will come to respect us for who we are as individuals and collectively as a community. And this will be the best thing we can do to properly fulfill our obligation to convey the message of this faith, this beautiful faith. One really quick story. A young lady who came, who went through our youth group at the Islamic Center of Southern California, where I was the imam for many years, she went on to USC, University of Southern California. And she, when she graduated at the end of four years, she was the valedictorian, which means she was the highest achieving student. But that wasn't the impressive thing. She, she was asked to give the speech as the valedictorian, but the impressive thing was that the night before graduation, she was asked to give the speech as a, as a baccalaureate speaker. Now, a baccalaureate speaker, some of you might not know what that is, it's the most well-rounded student. And it's usually two different people. That year, it was they were both her. She was both the baccalaureate speaker and the valedictorian. For she not only studied French and chemistry, pre-med, but she also 
started an interfaith community service uh, uh, network and, and student group. And she was uh, engaging with an active within the, the Muslim student group as well. And she was uh, uh, the most well-rounded student out of all the thousands that graduated that year. And when she stood before the select group of people the night before graduation, by invite only, of trustees and faculty and students, she gave a 10-minute speech, which you can find on YouTube. Her name is Sarah Shahawi, in which she says to all of these, primarily non-Muslims, what inspired me to excellence was my faith as a Muslim. SubhanAllah. And this young lady was none other than the granddaughter of Hassan Hatut, Allah Yarhamu who was granted another daughter after his first daughter died, and this is his daughter's daughter. She went on to Harvard, and she just graduated from there a couple of years ago. SubhanAllah. If we achieve excellence, we will, we will as individuals and community, be on the road uh, to achieving our goals here in this world and in the next. Let us ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for forgiveness, for guidance, يا الله أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ربنا هاتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا وقنا عذاب النار O Allah forgive us on this day of Jum'ah inspire us with the the teachings of the Quran and the example of Prophet Muhammad to carry forth that wisdom that that the character of the Prophet in our everyday lives. Let us to improve our relationships within our family and in our communities. O oh Allah, let us to conduct ourselves with the highest moral and ethical values in our workplace. O oh Allah, give us protection from harm. Give us success in this, in this life and in the next. And, let, let, and, and bestow your mercy and blessings upon the, the blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Ameen ya rabbil alameen. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم أقم الصلاة إن الصلاة تهانا كشاء والمنكر. I will be at the table in the back. Afterwards, I have some information about the university if you're interested. جزاكم الله خير. السلام عليكم.